Hi everybody, this is Philip Martin and welcome to On Film On Video for September 10th, 2021. Which is, golly, 20 years to the day after I saw, I, and I'm, 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 I'm thinking that I'm, I think this is true. I think this is actually correct. I think I remembered this. The last movie I saw before the morning of September 11th, which we'll talk about in a minute, was David Lynch's uh, Mulholland Drive, because we were at the, uh, the 2001 Toronto Film Festival, which was really a great festival. Timama Tambian was there, and Amelie was there, and Waking Life was there, and a few other films that, um, you know, really still matter to me, and really I still think about sometimes were there. It was probably the best festival that, that we had gone to. Um, we had started going around 1997, 1998 maybe, and we went a few years after that, uh, but it was, uh, but anyway, uh, in 2001 on September 10th, I think I went down to um, the Hyatt Regency or the Four Seasons or someplace, and I know that I interviewed uh, Arlen Howard, Arlen, Arliss, Arliss Howard, and Deborah Winger, who had done a movie called Big Bad Love, which was based on the uh, book of short stories by Larry Brown, the Mississippi writer who happened to be a friend of mine. Larry didn't make the trip to Toronto because it was a small production. He did have a small role in it. In fact, he played Arliss um, Howard's father in it, and Arliss Howard was playing a version of Larry Brown that they renamed Leon Barlow for this film. And I was a little disappointed that I was kind of hoping to see Larry there because uh, Larry and I actually were kind of friends. I mean, we had been out a few times. We, we, Andre Kodrescu, Larry Brown, and myself had a wild night in Oxford, Mississippi one evening where we closed down not one, but three bars. But that's something that I'll talk about some other time in some other venue. But anyway, Larry wasn't there, but I interviewed, you know, um, Arliss Howard and Deborah Winger, and I, I think I got off on the wrong foot with them because I was talking about how I knew Larry and how you know, I thought that you probably needed to be conversant with Larry's work and his life, his story, to really um, get into Big Bad Love that much. And I really do think that's true. I really think that if you see this film in a vacuum, and it's a good film, it's a... It's very surreal, but it's very small, vine episodic um, vignettes in a would-be Southern writer's life, uh, a guy who is a lot like Larry Brown, uh, the late Larry Brown, who passed away in 2004, actually. So I think that it really, but, and then I think I also got, I, I confused, um, I, I met Rance Howard one time, and Rance Howard is Ron Howard's father. And uh, I, meant, I, I alluded to Rance Howard in some way, and it did not really work real well because Arliss thought I thought he was talk, I thought he was his father, but I didn't. I just had some point. I, it, it was an awkward interview, but anyway, it wasn't a bad interview. Most of these interviews are awkward if you get anything good out of them at all. So I'm the, but that was the, one of the last things. And then um, that evening we went to see Mulholland Drive. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I asked Karen who keeps notes on these things, what her recollection was. And she went back and she read her notes to me about the trip, but they didn't include what we saw the last night. So it could have been something else. It could have been Buffalo Soldiers, the Joaquin Phoenix movie, but I think it was Mulholland Drive. Okay, we watch Mulholland Drive. Get up in the morning. It's a beautiful, clear September day. Cloudless, as I remember it, it was just beautiful you know and uh, take a taxi to the airport because that was back before we were <laughs> that was back when newspapers could spend money and could send two writers to the Toronto Film Festival for five days we saw th 30 films between us Karen and I saw 30 films between us in that festival um, so yeah, we split up a lot but we 
the last night, I know we've watched it, whatever it was, together. I think it was Mulholland Drive, which would be appropriate because Mulholland Drive was the last great movie of what I call the before. And then we go to the airport. And we're ready to go back. We, I think we fly to Chicago and then we fly on to Little Rock. So we get, we get back to Little Rock sometime early afternoon. Um, go through security, and there's no problem. We go through customs, which is right there, and, and it's no problem. And uh, we're standing in line. I'm standing in line to get a sandwich at, to, to take on the plane because we've got to go, of course, because we're going to the U.S. It's a, we go into the terminal, we've got to go down this hall, and our plane's at the end of the hall, and then we'll go out and out to Chicago. So it's a little ways down there. And I'm going to get a sandwich and there's a computer a TV monitor up on the wall uh, about 10 feet in front of me and I'm just kind of casually there's no sound just casually glancing up at it and I see this plane slicing into this building and it registers to me as a not very spectacular you know seen from a movie. It's like, you know, you'd think they would do more with the special effects. It, it would be, you know, it, it, I get what they're going at. It's sort of a verite, you know, kind of uh, found footage thing, but you'd still think that they would. And then I heard somebody curse, and then I heard somebody say something in German, and all of a sudden we sort of came around to the realization, this crowd of people I was in, that, that it was actually happening. And we didn't know where or what was actually happening, but this was something that was actually happening. And I remember we walked down toward our gate, and our gate was not open. I mean, was, you had to go down another uh, walkway or something that was not open. And, and then we heard a, a, a message that said that it, you know, that all flights had been delayed or something. And I remember we went back and we went back the wrong way. We went back through security the wrong way, came around and got back in front of the um, Delta, I think it was, America Delta desk. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm talking to the uh, person behind the counter. And this is, you know, this is not inside the airport proper. This is, this is before you go through security, you know, I'm back out there. And I'm asking her, I go, look, it looks like our plane's delayed. I just want to make sure we can get on the next flight out or whatever, whatever we need to do. And she's not really listening to me. She's got, you know, she's tapping and looking at my flight. And she's like, hmm, that's curious. That's curious. That's curious. And her supervisor walks up to her stands behind her and I could hear them I could hear her mumble a few things, you know, like I could hear flight numbers and I could hear stuff like that. And then they both kind of went white and looked at me and she said, I've never seen this before. US airspace is closed. Never seen it. I um, turned around to Karen and I said, get on the phone. We didn't have cell phones and this is how long ago it was. A lot of people did have cell phones, but we had we were late ado adopters of cell phones. In fact, this was what brought us into the cell phone market. So get back and see if we can get our hotel room back. So Karen went to the payphone there in Pearson and she gets on the payphone and I'm standing there for there's nothing to do. You know, it's like airspace is closed. We can't tell us anything. We don't know anything. So I turn and I walk. And as I walk past, I, there's a woman standing there in the between the 50 feet I've got to go from the desk to where Karen is at the telephone. There's a woman, she's holding a cell phone, and tears are streaming down her face. Anyway. Karen calls our hotel that we had just vacated, and they, they didn't have our room still, but they gave us another room, so we got a room back. Um, 
we got, I want to say an Uber, but we didn't get an Uber. There were no Ubers in. We got a limo driver. I don't know how this happened exactly, except I think we walked out and flagged him down. And he was a Sikh gentleman wearing the, the turban, and he had a blue shirt on and a, and, and a blue suit. And a very nice car. I think it was a Lincoln Town car. And we got in the back seat of the car, and we told him to take us back to the hotel. And he had the radio on, and the radio was you know, going nuts. And he started telling us all this stuff that had happened, that the, a, a plane had hit a building in New York. And he'd also said, well, there was a bomb at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, in Chicago. There had been a bomb had gone off, and the State, State Department was locked down. And there was various things going on all over the U.S. Um, there was a there was a plane that was on its way to San Francisco that uh, terrorists had taken hold of, or something like that. There was all these stories that he had already, and I mean, this is maybe. 15 minutes after we saw it happen. Anyway, so we get back to our hotel and we check back in. And uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, that was back, at, like I said, that was back in the days that uh, we um, had calling cards. It carried calling cards on wall. And punch it in so you know it's international call so I was calling the newsroom and I called the newsroom and I was talking to someone and they said well can you get to New York and I said yeah uh, yeah we could go to New York I mean how far is it and I don't know how far it is from New York to Toronto it's but it's six seven hours it's not undoable it's not a, a horrible you know ordeal to get there normally but but you know it's sort of like it's it's not something you just do on the spur of the moment either, right? I could be totally wrong. It could be 12 hours, but it was, you know, something in there, and I was like, okay, so the first thing I did was try to get a car. So I hung up in the office, and I tried to get a car. No cars. No cars. And this was before you could go on. Our, actually, we did have a computer, and we did use the internet, but this was before you used the internet to see, check for the availability of cars. I was calling, you know, Hertz and Avis and Budget, <laughs> trying to get a car to go to New York to go see what was going on, to report about it. That didn't happen. So, after about 45 minutes of trying to figure out what to do, the, th the only thing that we had to do, the only thing we could do, was to go back to the festival. So, we did go back to the festival and we went to a screening. A movie called Pinero about a um, Cuban poet and about halfway through the movie they shut it down and the, one of the festival people came out and said the director really is you know well, is real, we're, just, we're just suspending everything today and you know go go home and whatever so there's really no place for us to go so we went back to the force well I think it was Park Hyatt then was where the media center was and we went up there and there's about I don't know, 200 journalists from all over the country in this media center. It's a big room with this big TV, back before big TVs were ubiquitous. And we were watching the coverage, the CBC coverage on the thing. Um, the Toronto Star took a photograph of that crowd, and uh, we were on the front page the next day. I wish I could find it. Uh, Karen and I were front and center and watching the the mayhem going on. I remember that at one point somebody made a joke or uh, started clapping or something um, in the back about you know what had happened and the whole room just sort of turned and it was really one of those moments where you know I felt like I felt the, these people were in danger for making a stupid joke. I mean um, but we, we stayed there for a while and then we went out and wandered the streets of Toronto and um, a lot of places shut down. They shut down the mall. They shut down government buildings um, because everybody, they were fearing an attack. They thought that uh, whatever was happening might might be happening there too. I mean, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, World Trade Center um, attacks, 
really everybody thought that uh, you know this we didn't know what it was we didn't know whether you know we could expect missile attacks or whether there were going to be a lot more guerrilla attacks whether a lot more terrorist attacks and where they were going to happen and uh, so there was a really nervous so we basically went and walked Toronto and at some point we got a sandwich in a store and sat down in the park and ate it in the, with his college students and the black squirrels and you know people was people were so kind people were you know I remember there was a little girl who said that uh, Americans are like us and they had a banner hanging out of an apartment building I remember this was written on a big blanket our Canadian hearts are with you and we just kind of went through that whole day in kind of this weird days we were walking and walking and walking and and uh, thinking about things and I remember telling Karen that things were not going to be the same and I was right about that things have not been the same since uh, I said that this is a, this is a war and we're in it and who knows how it's going to be fought and where it's going to be fought and We went out that night to a Tibetan restaurant. It was one of the few places that was open, and it was uh, in this really nice part of Toronto, Bloor Street, and uh, it was really good. We went and had uh, momos and Tibetan food, and you know had a drink and some wine, and went back to our kind of high rise it was really a crappy hotel it's a high rise apartments that were being converted into a hotel it hadn't quite finished and there there was a lot of unfinished stuff going on there uh the elevators were very slow i remember that and we went back and tried to sleep and uh i didn't sleep very well and i remember we got up the next morning and i was just beat and the um, the buses had been shut down. I remember that because we tried that the first day too. We said, thought about getting a bus over the border and it had been shut down. So we were trapped there. And I took an Ambien <laughs> that morning after not being able to sleep. I remember this day. Um, I took half an Ambien. And uh, then Karen got the idea of let's try the bus stations again. And I was fighting through this Ambien. <laughs> I was like, and I called and they told us, they told me that the buses were running, but they had no guarantee that they could get over the border and they didn't really know what was going to happen, but they were going to try. So we packed up and we went down to the bus station, which was a few, a few miles, a few, a few blocks, a you know, mile and a half away, pulling our rolling suitcases back then because we'd been there for a while. We had a lot of luggage for us and we got on the bus. And there was about 15 other people on the bus, and we're all headed back for back to the United States, which felt like something to go back to the United States. And we hit, you know, we Niagara Falls is where you go across the border. You know? So we hit Niagara Falls, and you know, it's eerily peaceful. And we get to the bus station, which has the customs and the, you know, passport control and all that, and there's nobody there. And we're standing around for a minute, and all of a sudden someone pops up and goes, oh, like you surprised. And he goes, well, uh, okay, come on. And they just waved us through. There was absolutely nobody, nobody's bag got looked at, nobody was delayed or anything. We all just went right across the border, and now we're in America. And it felt really good to be in America it did uh, which is strange because you don't really feel qualitatively you don't feel much difference being in Canada Canada is you know like being in another state it's not alien to you I mean um, I like Canada a lot I mean but it doesn't feel exotic at all to me 
but it did feel different to be back in the United States and back in Buffalo, New York, where I hadn't been in, God, 40 years? How old was I? Yeah, about 35 years. I hadn't been there. And um, I didn't remember much about it, but it presents as it presents. It's a, it's an old upstate New York, you know, city, small city. We bought some food there and walked around, waited for the bus, and we took a bus to Cleveland. And I have not traveled on buses an awful lot as an adult. I have to have to admit that I'm not somebody who's taken a lot of long bus rides. Uh, this was probably the longest bus ride I've taken as an adult. Um, and it was a long bus ride. <laughs> uh, but, and you know, and, and it, it was almost like central casting put the people on there. You know, there was a lady with a baby and there was a sailor in his sailor suit and there was an older couple and there was an older older woman here and there was a young kind of edgy looking you know teenager here and there was me and Karen and we were sitting there and we could read so you know whatever and we we're riding along and you know you ride you know right along the bottom of the Great Lakes and it's a different part of the country than the South. It's like, you know, the prisons look like, high schools and the high schools look like prisons. And, you know, you see the ruins of all these factories and you see, you know, uh, this different America. And we came into Cleveland and went right downtown and we Karen's dad who was in his in his 80s then uh, picked us up I remember that he paid somebody to watch his car while when he parked which he didn't need to do and it was bad about that so Karen gave him back the five dollars or whatever he paid the guy um, and we went to his house that night and we got us a pizza and we washed our clothes and we did what we did, you know, he sort of, you know, I sat up and talked to him and um, he talked to me and the next morning we got the last rent a car from the airport and we went straight through 13 hours back home in our little, uh, God, what was this, this tiny little car, a little roller skate car. and nothing in the air no planes in the air listening to NPR I wrote a song about it which um, I'll put in the um, well, I don't know where I'll do it I mean, if I come if I might put it in the comments here the song if you want if you want to find it um, but um, I wrote a song about that experience and it's but we got home and and things have not been we talk about getting back to a new normal. We talk about that a lot recently in the wake of this pandemic, which we're still in, you know, we're not post-pandemic yet, but we're getting closer to post-pandemic. And we talk about going back to normal, and we talk about the new normal. Well, I think we're in whatever we're going to be in going forward, because things are never going to go back like before they were not before 9-11. Things never did. There was a clean before and after that moment. Everybody has got a story about it that can remember it, that was lived through it. Ours is, you know, perhaps, you know, no more or, or less dramatic than a lot of them. And, you know, I mean, we got stranded in Canada for a number of hours. We didn't get home for until three days after we thought we would um, it was inconvenient it was really scary I don't want anybody ever to forget how scared 
they were those days because we tend I mean we're looking back I mean I think that there's two things we do and one of those really true one of those really did feel connected to other Americans in a way you may not have felt before it's hard to imagine that we sort of did come together and there was a lot of ugliness that came out of it. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, jingoistic chest beating and, you know, ugly stuff, but it really did feel like, you know, we were all on the same side for a while. And now, you know, <laughs> it feels like it's impossible because, you know, it's like, you know, it's just not going to happen because you feel the way you feel. You just, that's just it. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> you don't want to take the vaccine. All right, you're not going to take it. You don't care what happens. All right, I, I get it. I get it. But they're all these moments. And I guess in an individual's life, some of them are very private. But there were a few of them, like the Kennedy assassination, like 9-11, and like this pandemic, even though this pandemic has been sort of a slow motion drawn out moment, hasn't it? Where we all do go through this together. And I don't have any raw, raw, you know, uplifting, you know, thing to end on here. It's just that you know, we made it through these 20 years. Not all of us, obviously, but if you're watching this, you know, you should be thankful about that. You should be thankful for that. And think about, you know, what led us here and what occasions these kinds of moments and how we might do better going forward. Anyway. That was, that's my 9-11 story, and um, I'll see you next week. Bye.